Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. That feels particularly loud this afternoon. Can you hear me in the back row up there? Excellent. Um, for those of you I've not had the pleasure of meeting, my name's Catherine Deverne, and I have the honor and privilege of being the eighth dean of what is now the Allard School of Law at UBC. And as we begin this afternoon, I'd like to acknowledge that we are on the traditional ancestral and unceded territory of the Musqueam people and are grateful every day to share this land. This year, 2020, marks the 75th anniversary of a law school at UBC, and we are celebrating throughout the year with a number of special initiatives, special events, parties, and distinguished lectures. So the Walter S. Owen Lecture is the first in this series, and so it's very exciting to have you with us today as we officially launch the Vancouver series of events. We actually had a, a kickoff party in Hong Kong a couple of weeks ago uh, with law school alumni there, but this is our first uh, public 75th anniversary event. Thank you so much for coming. I am honored to welcome this year's lecturer, the Honorable Malcolm Rowe, who is joining us, of course, from the Supreme Court of Canada, and we're very grateful to you for making the journey out here to be with us. The Walter S. Owen Chair in Law is the law school's first endowed chair, and it was established in 1982 in honor of alumnus Walter S. Owen and his many contributions to the legal community and the university. This lecture is a public expression of the law school's wish to commemorate Mr. Owen and to thank the members of the legal community and of his family whose contributions enabled this lecture to be endowed. This visitorship has been occupied, uh, as, as regular followers of this event will know, by a series of distinguished and internationally recognized scholars and jurists over time, and it contributes greatly to the life of the law school. And so I'd like to, at this moment, uh, recognize the Honorable Madam Justice Amy Francis, Walter Owen's granddaughter, who will say a few words on behalf of the Owen family. Justice Francis is a judge of the Supreme Court of British Columbia, uh, where she was appointed almost a year ago now. Um, so she's on a very steep learning curve that's probably a little bit like first year law once again. <laughs> Um, she did her undergraduate degree here at UBC and studied law at the University of Toronto and was called to the bar um, prior to becoming a judge in both British Columbia and Ontario. Um, and uh, it's very special for us here at the law school. She's also been an adjunct professor here for many years and has taught succession law. So please join me in welcoming Justice Francis. Catherine, it's my privilege to say a few words about my grandfather, Walter Owen, in advance of Justice Rowe's lecture, and I'm happy to say that I'm not the only member of the extended Owen family here. My parents, Michael and Daphne Francis, are also here today, as are my uncle and aunt, uh, Stephen Owen and Diane Owen. So, Walter Owen, as those of you who have been to this lecture before, uh, know has a storied uh, history in the legal profession in British Columbia. He was born in 1904 in Atlin, BC, which for those of you who don't know, is a very small town in the farthest north of British Columbia. It's a place where in the late 19th century many people, including my grandfather's family, came to seek their fortunes in the gold rush. Walter's father became a police officer and went on to become chief of the provincial police and later warden at Ocala Prison. From these relatively humble roots, my grandfather became a leader in the legal profession in British Columbia. In 1933, he was the youngest Crown Prosecutor in Canada. He ended up in private practice where he co-founded two law firms, including the law firm of Owen Bird, which, unlike most mid-sized law firms in Vancouver, still exists. He served as chair of the Canadian Bar Association, and from 1973 to 1978, he served as Lieutenant Governor of British Columbia. This last fall, my eldest cousin, Lisa, gave a lovely gift to all of Walter's children and grandchildren. She discovered some audio recordings from a CKNW interview that my grandfather gave in 1978 after the conclusion of his term as Lieutenant Governor. 
Lisa digitized these interviews and sent them to each of us. I had the opportunity to inter listen to the interview last week and to hear my grandfather's voice for the first time since before his death in 1981 when I was nine years old. The interview contained moments entirely consistent with family lore about my grandfather. His knack for storytelling, his gruff delivery, his great pride in his family. But there was one moment in the interview where it seemed to me that my grandfather, from 42 years in the past, was directly speaking to the topic of today's lecture. Now, by way of context, my grandfather died the year before the Charter was enacted, so he did not witness its transformative effect on Canadian law. The notion that judges would have any role in public policy would likely be quite foreign to him. He was well known as a private citizen to take public stands on matters of importance to him, but he was no activist. His faith in institutions of government and the rule of law was unshakable. In the CKNW interview in 1978, he was asked why he'd never expressed any interest in becoming a judge. His response, I am a man of strong opinions, so I would probably commit an injustice. I say with some confidence after listening to that interview that my grandfather would have been at the front of the line to hear a Supreme Court of Canada justice speaking about judicial restraint. On behalf of the extended Owen family, we are so grateful to have Justice Rowe here today. Thank you. Thank you very much, Amy. It's now my pleasure to introduce our lecturer. This year, we welcome the Honorable Malcolm Rowe. Justice Rowe graduated from Osgoode Hall Law School in 1978, and he was a member of the bars in both Ontario and in his home province of Newfoundland and Labrador. Justice Rowe was clerk assistant to the provincial legislature at the start of his career, and then he joined the diplomatic service and represented Canada both at the United Nations and in Havana, two very fascinating appointments to have held. He entered private practice in Ottawa and became a partner at Gowling's, where his work included advising the Canadian government on international and public law matters. Justice Rowe has lectured at the University of Ottawa Law Faculty in the areas of constitutional law and public law more broadly. He's served as the chair of the International Law Section of the Canadian Bar Association. In 1996, he became Secretary to Cabinet, Head of the Public Service for Newfoundland and Labrador. And in 1999, he was appointed to the Superior Court of that province, and two and a half years later, to that province's Court of Appeal. He has served as Chair of the Advisory Committee on Federal Judicial Appointments, and he was appointed to the Supreme Court of Canada in October 2016. Please join me in welcoming the Honourable Malcolm Rowe. Je suis heureux d'être ici pour vous parler cet après-midi avec mes collègues à la Cour suprême du Canada. J'aime beaucoup rencontrer des étudiants, des professeurs et des, des avocats à travers le pays. Je suis honoré d'avoir été invité à prononcer le lecture Owen aujourd'hui. To begin, let me pose a simple but fundamental question. How should the three principal institutions of the state, the legislature, the executive, and the courts, relate to one another? Note, this is not about what gets decided. Rather, it is about who gets to decide what. It is not about the content of public policy, rather it is about the process by which that policy is decided. For almost 50 years, which gives you a, some indication of my age, I have reflected on this question. My view, one that I see as both principled and practical, favors judicial restraint. This runs against the tide. 
it warrants explanation. Um, I'm going to give you some personal context, but I think a great deal of that has been, all, has been dealt with in, in the introduction. And I'll just skip to say that I have been a student of government throughout my adult life. In addition to a great deal of reading, I've had first-hand experience as to how the institutions of the state operate. I mean, it, it has been my great good fortune to have a role, a modest role, in the legislature. And the legislature is a very different place than the executive. Uh, I mean, the uh, uh, former minister here understands the, the role of a parliamentarian, understands the role of a minister, and it's not the same at all. They're related, but the two functions have, have a distinct character. And I was extremely fortunate to gain an understanding of the legislature at an early age. I've worked at the federal level. Uh, I was a fairly junior official in the Department of uh, Foreign Affairs. Uh, but I was a, advised at a fairly senior level on matters in Ottawa. And I was ahead of, uh, being the head of the public service in Newfoundland, I mean, you get to sit in the cabinet room. You get to meet with the premier every day. You're involved in, I mean, I used to write the speech to the throne. You have a hand in budgets. You understand the, the, the decisions, albeit the decisions within the executive have to be properly taken by those who are elected. Those of us who were appointed, uh, we advised. We gave a framework of analysis, but the decisions have to be taken by those who are elected. And, and I've also seen a bit of the institutions in the international context. When I was appointed to the Superior Court of Newfoundland in 1999, I left behind the institutions of government and took on quite a different responsibility. I was sitting in judgment on matters affecting not thousands of people and billions of dollars, but one or a handful of my fellow citizens. My responsibility deepened with respect to the lives of the people who were before me on a criminal matter, on a, on a family matter, whatever. But the Im impact of my decisions became far more narrow. Things didn't change that much when I went to the Court of Appeal. The work of the Courts of Appeal is largely error correction, and they infrequently create jurisprudence. They do part of the time, but a, a fair amount of the heavy lifting is given over to the nine of us who sit in Ottawa. Thus, for 17 years, I was in the judging business, but I was out of the public policy business. In 2016, when I was appointed to the Supreme Court of Canada, I was still in the judge judging business, but I got back into the public policy business. Every decision by every judge, at whatever level of court, is of great importance to the parties who appear before the court. So I'm not saying that the Supreme Court of Canada's decisions are more important than those of other judges. Rather, what I am saying is that the decisions of the Supreme Court of Canada have a far wider impact, oftentimes of significance for the country. Von Clauschwitz wrote that war is the continuation of politics by other means, but judging should not be the continuation of politics by other means. Government is about policy and financial choices, all against a political backdrop and with a system of checks and balances in the operation of governmental institutions. I understand that world. More than 20 years ago, I went to the bench, and I understand that world too. Each has its role in our society. Keeping those roles within their proper relationship is fundamental to me. Now, just to step back and perhaps pick up on a point in the introduction. Until the Constitution Act 1982, legislatures were supreme, subject to the federal provincial division of powers. Judges interpreted and applied laws, which is a more policy-laden exercise than is usually advertised, by the way. But courts did not invalidate laws. Executive action was reviewed under administrative law. Well, things changed, of course, with the Charter and with the uh, provision of Aboriginal and treaty rights uh, in Section 35, and with the express authority to invalidate any law 
to the extent of its inconsistency with the Constitution. Before 1982, and I graduated from law school in 1978, so I'm part of that dying generation who, who were, had their full formation uh, in, in law school uh, completed before, before the Charter. But before 1982, judges accepted that public policy was largely for parliamentarians and for ministers, and not for them. After 1982, judges had to adapt to their additional public policy role. At first, the traditional judicial culture was a gentle break on constitutional litigation. But things changed. Early decisions were well received. And as I mentioned when I was speaking to some of the faculty, Dean Dover was kind enough to convene some of her colleagues, and we had a nice chat. But one of the people I think was absolutely critical in this period was Brian Dixon. I mean, Chief Justice Dixon, his, his, I read his jurisprudence, it stands up remarkably well. And I think there's enormous guidance and wisdom that one can still draw from those foundational cases written particularly by the former Chief Justice and, and his colleagues. But the decisions were well received by Canadians. Canadians embraced the Charter. Confidence grew not only in the legitimacy of the Charter and the new role for the courts, but the central importance of giving effect to the Charter in the lives of Canadians. Legal education, legal practice, and jurisprudence became increasingly Charter-oriented. Before 1982, judicial restraint was hardwired into the system. Judges didn't have a choice. They had a limited role. After 1982, the hard wire connected judges to the power to invalidate laws. Restraint was no longer imposed by the system. Now it is more a matter of outlook, of how one sees the role of the courts. The Chief Justice of Manitoba, as Court of Queen's Bench, Glenn Joyal said in 2017, and I quote, a broad cross-section of Canadians have an almost unconditional willingness to accept judicial adjudication of often complex social and political problems. What were once political issues are now frequently transformed into legal issues, end of quote. I would reformulate slightly what Chief Justice Joyal said. The nature of the issues remains the same. What has changed is who makes the decisions. To a greater degree, it is judges who do so. This brings me to my, the, the, the second part of the, uh, the title, Who Guards the Guardians? Um, why do I say restraint is a virtue? My, my explanation begins in perhaps an improbable place in Plato's Utopia, the Republic. In the Republic, Plato describes an ideal society guided by an elite, the guardians. But what if they step outside their proper role? Who will guard against the guardians? It seems the guardians will guard themselves, as they will be virtuous, and their virtues will include self-restraint. History shows that while individuals or groups who strive towards bringing about an ideal society have generally had a very positive effect on the human condition. But where this has led to the exercise of unchecked power, things sometimes go wrong. Plato's philosopher kings would almost certainly have proven Lord Acton's famous dictum that all power corrupts and absolute power corrupts absolutely. Aristotle expressed a somewhat similar view in his politics when he wrote that it would be bad in any case for a man, sub subject as he is to all the accidents of human passion, to have the supreme power. I think he was concerned about tyranny here, in fact. Uh, Aristotle placed reliance on laws arrived at by the many rather than on uh, rule by a few of the best. He wrote, the multitude ought to be supreme rather than the few best. I'm not suggesting that Aristotle was a Democrat. I think he would have been quite happy with collective leadership 
um, probably some sort of an oligarchical arrangement as you had in the Venetian Republic, where there was a collective leadership. It was very diffuse, but it was held by a, a privileged group, in fact, in Venice. So, as with uh, in Plato's Republic, our society too has its guardians. Prominent among them are judges. But what if the judges step outside their proper role? Who will guard against these guardians? I think they will guard themselves and because they are virtuous, and I trust that one of their virtues is self-restraint. Now let me describe what I think are three habits of mind that support restraint. The first is pragmatism. The second is recognizing the wisdom of experience. And the third one is seeing the proper operation of the legal system as an end in and of itself. First, with respect to pragmatism, by inclination and experience, I am a pragmatist. By this, I mean that I see practicality as a more reliable guide than ideology. I draw a distinction with expediency which readily contemplates departure from principle. Rather, I mean an approach grounded in principle, but shaped by considerations of consequence. To me, this is self-evident. But it warrants repetition, as what is so obvious to me may well be contested by others. I'm going to give an example of a decision of the Supreme Court of Canada in which, and I'm only going to refer to my own reasons in, in that decision. It's the 2018 decision in the Mikasu case. And what was at issue in Mikasu was whether the duty to consult with respect to Aboriginal and treaty rights is engaged in the preparation of legislation before it is presented to Parliament. It was not in question that the duty to consult arose in other circumstances, in Haida and the line of cases that followed Haida. Uh, the court had said the duty to consult operates in the exercise of delegated authority. When the executive acts upon authority delegated by the legislature, it must be mindful of the consequences uh, for claimed Aboriginal and treaty rights. I draw the distinction there briefly because where the rights have been established through litigation, for example, in Chilcote, or they've been established by a treaty, a modern treaty, then you look to the guidance that's provided in Chilcote as to the exercise of Aboriginal title, or you look to uh, the, the terms of the treaty itself, if it's a modern treaty, as, as, as in terms of the interests and the rights of Aboriginal peoples. But you have a claim which is not yet vindicated through a court decision or is not yet recognized and given effect through a modern treaty, the honor of the Crown requires that the Crown be mindful of uh, uh, the interests uh, of uh, Aboriginal peoples who are affected and accommodate their interests to the extent that that is possible. So the question was whether before legislation was uh, placed before Parliament, there was a duty to consult and I joined with the majority. As a matter of fact, it was a unanimous decision in the result, although it split several ways in terms of the reasoning. The reasons that I wrote emphasized the practical consequences of recognizing the engagement of the duty to consult in the preparation of legislation. Now, before we go on any further, you might say, well, how can I mix up practical consequences with the protection of rights? I mean, rights have to be decided on the basis of principles. I would agree entirely. But the duty to consult is not the Aboriginal right. The duty to consult is a modality. It is a mechanism. It is a form of remedy by which one seeks to uh, protect the underlying right. So it is it's the interest in the land. It's the it's traditional practice, which is the right. Uh, the duty to consult is simply a means to ensure that, that it is protected. So in my view, it was quite valid to have regard to practical considerations as to these modalities, as opposed to what has to be done in terms of the definition of the, of the interests of the right, which has to be firmly grounded in principle. 
Anyway, let me get down to the business at hand. Uh, I said, look, there's, there's a lot of complexity in, in the preparation of legislation. Counsel for the Mikasu, who was very able counsel, Mr. Jaynes, placed before the court fortuitously a document prepared by the Privy Council Office, which set out 29 steps in the process to approve legislation. Of these 29 steps, 16 preceded the tabling of legislation in Parliament. Would the duty to consult be engaged in some or possibly several of these 16 steps? Which legislation would trigger the duty to consult? Which indigenous groups would need to be consulted? How would one determine whether consultation had been adequate? And recall, all of this would occur before legislation is presented to the legislature. As well, what about disputes as to the foregoing questions? Whether the legislation triggered the duty to consult, whether who was consulted, whether the consultation was adequate. Would this not be settled by the courts? And if so, would not the courts undertake a role that they had never before undertaken to oversee the process by which legislation is prepared? And what about the duty to accommodate? Would not the courts be called on to decide whether draft legislation adequately addressed concerns that were made evident through the consultation? Thus, conceivably, would not the courts be called upon to decide whether legislation could be considered by Parliament, in other words, if the duty to accommodate had been adequately fulfilled, or whether legislation could not be considered by Parliament. These are very deep waters indeed. And I, I hasten to exercise. Once approved by Parliament, legislation could be challenged for inconsistency with Section 35.1 under Sparrow. So it's not a question of whether indigenous groups, First Nations, whatever, can have their day in court. It's what point it occurs. Is it, it, is it after the legislation is approved, or is it in the preparation of the legislation? And in the Mikasu decision, we said it's afterwards. Under Sparrow, you can challenge the validity, or under Haida, you can challenge the exercise of delegated authority. In raising these practical concerns, and here's where I, I bring it back to the role between the courts and, and the other principal institutions in the state, I underline the difference between a policy to consult in the preparation of legislation and a constitutional obligation to do so. Policy can be enshrined in legislation, for example. Maybe you've done something like that here in BC. But constitutional obligations, and I hasten to add, a policy which is not uh, legislatively based can be varied by the executive. The cabinet can say, we're going to follow a different policy. If it's enshrined in legislation, the legislature can amend the policy in light of experience. But constitutional obligations are defined and supervised by the courts. This is a fundamental difference. In all of this, I sought to be guided by both principle and pragmatism. These two should never be strangers one to the other. Rather, they should be the firmest and closest of friends. I'll skip over the wisdom of experience. The legal system as a means rather than an end. I would pose a question that perhaps is not often asked. Does one see the legal system as a means or as an end? If you represent a client, then of course it is a means. You're seeking to achieve a, a certain result for your client. But if you are a jurist, which is it? One can say that this is a false dichotomy. The legal system is, of course, both a means and an end. But the question is nonetheless valid when posed in the following way. As a judge, do you see the law principally as a means by which to achieve substantive aims? For example, greater social justice. Or do you see the law as a system whose coherence and proper operation itself is paramount? If the latter, 
then you focus more on which of the institutions of the state makes what decisions and on the methodology by which doctrine develops. To put it another way, judges that see law as a means focus on the outcome of decisions more, while those judges who see the system of law as an end in itself focus on who decides and by what means. The operation of legislatures has evolved since the 13th century. I mean, the model parliament was 1265. That was a long time ago. 700 years of experience in, in terms of the development of these institutions. And the relationship between the executive, with the monarch personally for a very long time, and the legislature has evolved throughout a similar period. The assuming its modern form more or less in the mid 1800s. Are these institutional arrangements valuable embodiments of wisdom? Or is it, are they things to be departed from simply to facilitate a certain outcome? What is the trajectory of such changes if we essentially depart from these deep patterns of, of the relationship between the institutions? It warrants reflection. In my view, the stable and predictable functioning of institutions of the state is fundamental. Over time, the system evolves. That is the genius of the approach that we inherited from Britain and that we have adapted to our own circumstances, including the Constitution Act 1982 and the jurisprudence which has developed from it. In evolutionary terms, the system has maintained stability as it has adapted. In this fundamental way, the system is a success. The stable and predictable operation of the institutions of the state is for me an end in and of itself. By this I do not express any aversion to change in the role of the state or in the content of government policies. To the contrary, stable institutions can be effective instruments of profound change and stable institutions help ensure that such changes endure and can be built upon. Now, I'm going to touch on one of the differences uh, that has manifested itself since 1982 in terms of the kind of decisions that have, uh, the courts have been called upon to make. Many more of them are what I'd call governmental type decisions. And what do I mean by this? Regulation of conduct, including the operation of the economy, the allocation of public resources, and the determination of patterns of decision making by the institutions of the state. I should not be understood to criticize any particular decision or resulting rule. That is not my purpose. Rather, it is to underline that the determination of such issues removes courts from their traditional role of dispute resolution between parties in the application of general rules and places them instead in the traditional uh, role of legislatures and the executive in deciding what are sometimes complex public policy issues. It's interesting that in consideration of these issues, various sources of guidance are urged upon the courts. And, and my initial intention was to speak about international law here. But it's, it's a little hot these days, so I think I'll leave it alone. <laughs> What I am going to speak about is what is now presented to the court as recognition of unwritten constitutional principles. In two notable cases, the PEI court judges reference and the secession reference, the latter being perhaps more widely known, the Supreme Court of Canada used what is often referred to as structural analysis to fill in the gaps in defining the relationship among the institutions of the state. Just to recall, what was the secession reference about? The, the questions that were posed to the Supreme Court of Canada were, under what effectively, under what circumstances could Quebec secede from the Canadian Federation? And, uh, and the court said, well, there's nothing in the Constitution about that. There was no contemplation of secession. And so the court was called upon to draw upon the framework 
that undergirded, in a sense, uh, the, con the Canadian Constitution uh, and, and drawn principles, principles such as democracy, the rule of law, and the independence of the judiciary. And, and for these purposes, the court looked to, among other things, the preamble of the Constitution of, Act in, of 1867, which provides that uh, Canada shall have a constitution similar in nature to that of the United Kingdom. So all of the practices that had evolved over the centuries uh, were received, in a way, into Canadian constitutional law, albeit it was unwritten, which makes it really interesting. And then another principle which was drawn on was the principle of federalism. Well, that didn't come from the United Kingdom, because at the time the United Kingdom was a unitary state in 1867. What it came from was the division of powers, which was incorporated and was the, the main purpose behind uh, the Constitution Act of 1867. There were these underlying constitutional principles that in, in, a, in a structural way the judges of the court uh, drew upon and framed out a, uh, an answer to the question as to under what circumstances uh, Quebec could secede. And they said basically, clear answer, clear question, uh, that would trigger an obligation to negotiate, essentially, the, the secession. That's very much the bumper sticker version. But these principles underpin the relationship of the institutions of the state. This is fundamentally different from unwritten constitutional principles that are urged upon the court today, which are not about the relationship of the institutions of the state, but are rather presented by advocates who desire certain policies to be given effect. The policies might be about the environment. Policies might be about aspects of social policy. And, and, and advocates come in and say, well, here are unwritten constitutional principles. Give effect to them, courts. Now, if we give effect to a constitutional principle, who can overrule us? The answer is no one. And so what really these advocates are saying is accept a certain set of guides as to substantive policy and give effect to them to your authority as the ultimate constitutional arbiter in this country. Again, those are very deep waters and it warrants great reflection as to whether we go down that road as opposed to what is entirely legitimate, the structural argument that was used in the secession reference where the court is called upon to answer questions for which no ready answer is provided, but for which an answer is needed for the proper operation of the Canadian state. I'm going to touch on as well institutional capacity. I can attest as to how decisions are made by the legislature and the executive. I've been fortunate in, in that regard. These decisions generally involve a complex set of interlocking processes engaging many senior decision makers, supported by a great number of experts and advisors, subject to constant and searching oversight by elected officials, by central agencies, by uh, institutions established to assist Parliament, such as the Auditor General, by questioning in the legislature, and by commentary and criticism publicly. There is enormous institutional capacity within the executive, and, they, and they, they, they exercise this relying upon a broad base of expertise and subject to considerable oversight. Contrast this with the courts. Few judges have any experience or meaningful understanding of government. Lawyers who appear before them are often similarly lacking. There is a reason for this. Lawyers are trained and experienced in the resolution of particular disputes, but increasingly, lawyers on behalf of their clients are calling on judges to make decisions that are governmental in nature. But none of these actors have anything akin to the institutional capacity possessed by governments to make decisions of that nature. Well, 
Lawyers are a confident bunch. So they plunge ahead unrestrained by concern or doubt. Of course, counsel have a duty to fearlessly advocate for their client. Lord Mansfield's dictum, be it justicia, ruit coelum, uh, applies. <clears throat> but things have gotten a little more complicated than when Lord Mansfield wrote those words in 1768. Judges, especially in the appellate courts, need to be mindful of the wider consequences of their decisions. These extend often far beyond the immediate parties. Justice Marshall Rothstein, who was a friend of mine, he's a lovely man, was acutely aware of the limitations that courts faced when they uh, rewrite what can be complex government policies. In his dissent in the 2015 Mounted Police Association case, he wrote, courts must be especially cautious when dealing with questions of socioeconomic policy, just as the government, just as the government and legislatures must respect the court's expertise as judicial bodies, so too must courts appreciate that they are not best placed to make determinations as to which specific social or economic policy choice is most appropriate, end of quote. This tends to be referred to as a deferential approach to the legislature and the executive. Deference is not a term that I would use. The courts have a role assigned to them under the Constitution Act 1982 to review laws and policies for their conformity with the Constitution. I cannot defer to legislation if that means failing to carry out my responsibilities as a judge. But nonetheless, in carrying out those responsibilities, I always bear in mind that my understanding of the complexities in any legislative scheme are inferior to those who put forward the laws. In a way, I feel a degree of restraint because I know enough to know how little I know. In his recent book on the House, the former law clerk of the House of Commons, Robert Walsh, wrote, Government bills are usually very complicated, often hundreds of pages of highly technical and legalistic text. It's important to remember that government bills are the product of considerable research and study by policy and legal experts. Sometimes it can take several years before a government bill is ready for introduction to the House. Now, I was fortunate, <laughs> again, in that I was deeply involved. As a matter of fact, I coordinated the preparation of two quite extensive pieces of legislation, well, one more extensive than the other. One was the uh, uh, complete rewriting of that part of the Canada Labour Code, which dealt with occupational safety and health. This was some years ago, and the elder Mr. Trudeau was still Prime Minister. I was quite young at the time. And, and the latter was the National Transportation Act 1986, which was a completely new piece of legislation. I had to tell you, the complexity, especially the National Transportation Act, was remarkable. We had all these big Gantt charts and study teams and consultations, and we had um, drafting teams, and it was, it was really an exercise in coordination. That's what I was involved in, the subjective, the substantive policy content was for others who knew what they were talking about. My job was just to kind of deliver the product on time, uh, which um, uh, the government was contented with. Mr. Mazankowski was particularly concerned because he had been the Minister of Transport and then he was shuffled. He just wanted to make sure the thing arrived intact, which it did. I'm going to turn now to the need for checks and balances, or perhaps the value of checks and balances. Good government is one that is subject to a thorough and well-integrated set of checks and balances in the exercise of authority. As I said before, the executive is accountable to the legislature. The legislature is accountable to the public. And uh, the public can, of course, replace the political leaders periodically through elections. For profoundly important reasons, judges do not face election, but rather have a security of tenure. I mean, this is absolutely foundational, and I'm not in any way suggesting we should depart from that. That has to remain as it is. 
This makes eminently good sense, when, particularly when courts adjudicate particular disputes. But when courts make governmental type decisions, their power is not limited by the checks and balances that apply to the other two main institutions of the state, the executive and the legislature. Essentially, we decide without such limits. It is at this juncture that the outlook of judges as to the role becomes critical. It's more important because the judges must show restraint themselves. The system does not impose it. As I said before, before 1982, restraint was hardwired into the system, into a limited role that judges played. Now judges are hardwired with enormous authority. Courts, by multiple and cumulative accretions, their range of decision making are undertaking a greater and greater role in what are effectively governmental type decisions. I mean, some of this is inevitable. Some of this is just inherent in the whole enterprise of the Charter. I mean, this, this isn't something that can be avoided. I mean, we have to face it, it's part of our job. It's the, it's the approach we take to it. It's the habits of mind we bring to it, not whether we should be doing it. It's our responsibility to do it, and we must do it diligently, honestly, and to the best of our ability. I tend not to look to the United States for commentary on institutional arrangements. The United States has a different set of institutional arrangements. But I'm going to give you a quote from uh, an author, Bruce Gibney, from a book called The Making and Breaking of the American Legal System. And he said, one reason that the judicial mythology of a limited role for the courts is so lovingly tended to by the bench is because judicial power is largely self-regulated, fettered only by judges' own intelligence and integrity and pushback from colleagues. These are no small things, but they are internal controls and the other branches of government cannot easily undo judicial work, for good reason. Went on to say, as to core constitutional rulings, there's nothing anyone can do short of the flatly impractical means of amending the Constitution. In this, I think the situation is the same on both sides of the border. We've got section 33, in which certain override allowed to the legislatures in limited circumstances. Maybe it's not such a happy thing when 33 is used, but it's there. It's part of the, it's part of the framework. Justice Robert Sharp wrote in his book, which I commend to you highly, by the way, Good Judgment Making Judicial Decisions. It's every one of my clerks, I give last year, this year, next year, is going to get a copy of this book. But uh, what Robert wrote was, discretion vests the decision maker with a measure of both freedom and power. But the freedom is constrained and the power must be exercised responsibly. The decision maker must strive to find a just outcome that is very different from the freedom to do whatever the decision maker wants. Lord Bingham put it succinctly in his book, The Rule of Law, the job of judges is to apply the law, not to indulge their personal preferences. Isn't that really what Aristotle was concerned about in the quotes that I gave earlier? Sharp and Bingham are renowned jurists, each with a moderately liberal outlook, I think. Each, in their own way, counsels a degree of self-restraint. In this, I agree with them both. I've been called upon to serve my country as a jurist. In this, I recall that the authority conferred on me is transient. It is not personal. It is not really mine. I only hold it in trust. I exercise it, or I seek to exercise it, I should say, thoughtfully, diligently, and honestly. I will seek to pass it on intact, neither underutilizing it nor using it beyond its proper compass. I come now to those most welcome words in closing. 
challenge in preparing this lecture has been to give form and coherence to what seems diffuse and disparate. While it is a personal view, I hope it is not too much about me. Save for a postscript, which I will give in a moment, I end as I began, more or less, in Plato's Republic. The questions from his utopia endure. Who will guard the guardians? They will guard themselves. They are virtuous, are they not? And my postscript is as follows. While there is considerable continuity in Canadian society, it is remarkably different from when I was a boy. Canada was then, and is today, a free and prosperous society, but it was certainly not inclusive. Nor had we begun to bind up the wounds of our wrongs, especially with indigenous peoples. We had not even acknowledged that they existed. Today, I am confident that we have the will to move forward step by step to achieve reconciliation and by so doing to become our better selves. The Canada de nos jours est une société plus réfléchie et inclusive. Nous nous sommes engagés sur une voie qui favorise la diversité où chaque personne peut être appréciée pour ses qualités. When I was a boy, this was a good country. It is a better country today, and I am optimistic for the future. Thank you. Thank you very much, Justice Rowe. Um, Justice Rowe has agreed uh, to take a few questions, and I will um, uh, police if you happen to want to ask something that a sitting judge cannot opine about. I will, um, of course, Justice Rowe can tell you that, but I might also admonish you if you'd like. <laughs> yes, please. This brings us back to the unwritten constitutional principles. You can call them unwritten constitutional principles, call them quasi-constitutional things. We had an advocate who appeared before us recently who, who said environmental legislation is quasi-constitutional in nature. I posed a question, shall we say. And I said, isn't it really different in nature than, say, the Elections Act or the House of Commons Act, which really describes the structure of the state? I'm going to step back and not speak about international law, but talk about comparative law, the important difference between the two. If you look at the constitutions of many states, what they have is policies embedded in the constitution. And therefore, to the extent that the courts have a role in, in, in ensuring there's adherence to the constitution, the courts are called upon to say, has the government fulfilled its obligation vis-a-vis -vis the environment, vis-a-vis -vis providing proper education or, you know, the needs of individuals. Our constitutional arrangements to date have not been structured in that way. If you look at the Constitution Act 1867, uh, you could say maybe implicitly with respect to language rights, minority language rights, there's a few policies in there, but as a general proposition, it really is about who gets to decide what, the feds or the provinces. Um, the Constitution Act 1982, Aboriginal treaty rights, always sui generis, always bit off to itself, um, doesn't really have much in the way of positive rights. There are some. Again, we come back to minority language education, the right to vote, things like this. I suppose you can say freedom of expression is a positive right, but the other way of looking at it is you can't infringe upon it. You, 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 government cannot act so as to negatively uh, deny it. So our constitutional arrangements haven't embodied policy 
the policy has been left to the other institutions, the legislature and the executive. And the courts have been the ones who said, who gets to decide what, not what gets decided. And I can't say what's going to happen in the future, but until now, I think there has been a great reluctance to venture into the area. I mean, another way of looking at it, it was quite blunt. The authority to amend the Constitution is set out in the Constitution Act 1982. That authority is vested in the legislatures. It's not vested in the court. Now, by giving effect to things like Section 7 of the Charter, which is a very wide text, difficult to see how that will develop over time. But I, I guess the short answer is, until now, I'm not aware of any recognition by the courts, at least at the highest levels, of quasi-constitutional principles that embody substantive policies. No. Thank you. Yes, in the middle. Somebody's bringing you a microphone. Hi, my name is Veronica. I'm a first year student here. I was wondering, um, I guess you've already spoken about judicial restraint. I was, on my end, I feel that sometimes judicial restraint is a mechanism by which marginalized peoples and also indigenous peoples, their rights can be, um, it's an argument for ignoring their rights and by this way we can see that we're actually not applying the rule of law. It particularly, you could see, for example, in Silcotin, um, the fact that the court said that, on the one hand, I know you weren't on the bench at the time, but um, on the one hand saying that sovereignty isn't founded according to, like, it, we don't get our source in terra nullius, but then still not questioning um, the basis of the Canadian state's sovereignty. And I would assume that comes from, to an extent from sovereignty, uh, from judicial restraint and saying that we don't have, like the court shouldn't be the one talking about this issue, but then I wondered, um, I should talk a little quicker. Uh, just basically, to an extent, is that not the application? Is that the court not just applying the law? And then how can we talk about the rule of law? Thank you. Sorry. It I mean, there's a couple of sort of broad comments. First thing is, you can't understand Canada unless you understand it as an offshoot of the British Empire. Why do I say that? The Constitution Act 1867, what is it? It's an imperial statute. It, it created the country. And the sovereignty which had been exercised by sovereignty, I think, I think in this instance, I mean effective control that the British had uh, exercised with respect to Canada. That was transferred from the colonial uh, governments into a new national government in the Dominion of Canada. And there's, there's a continuity that arises from that root. Now, I understand why Aboriginal peoples will say, well, there are other routes of authority and sovereignty which we wish to put forward. This is not the time for me to comment on that, but I, I recognize that th those questions have been posed. But in the end, the judges of the Canadian courts have to, I think, say the source of our authority is the Canadian Constitution. Otherwise, what is it? And to the extent that there's an interplay that arises through 35.1 of the Constitution Act 1982, that too is part of the Constitution. But I do not know how I, as a judge, can look beyond the scope of my authority, anywhere beyond the constitutional arrangements under which I was nominated and by which I hold office and by which I render decisions. Thank you very much. Um, how about up there in the dark jacket, yes, you, who just looked for the person potentially behind you. Please go ahead. Oh, hang on. You are quite far away, so uh, we will bring you a microphone. 
If the role of legislature is to manifest the will of the majority, then isn't it fair for the judiciary to be the protector of the people's interests, minority interests? Moreover, what if it was the will of the majority that the judiciary be more activist? Could we then restructure the courts to protect people's interests actively? Uh, within the question, I think there's, a, a, beg my, uh, if I might beg your pardon, a certain mixing up of the roles because the persons who are elected to legislatures are not only on the government side, they're also on the opposition side. And, and uh, you might say, well, you know, conservative governments tend to favor economic development and growth and are less mindful. I'm not sure that in Canada that's the case. You used to have red Tories once upon a time. Uh, and I used to be a red Tory until they were hunted to extinction. <laughs> But, uh, but th that interplay of policy and might, might be called politics, but I prefer sort of the clash of interests and perspectives and values, that really is for a different forum in the broad sense of what should the direction of the society be, what should the major policies be, how should, how should resources be allocated, etc. Our role as judges is to give effect to the constitutional arrangements. So we got the division of powers in the 1867 Act, and in the 1982 Act, you've got the Charter, you've got Aboriginal and Treaty Rights, the principal components there. If it isn't in the Charter, and it isn't in Section 35.1, it ain't our business, because that's our business, is to give effect to those rules and to give meaning to them, which is a dynamic process. The wording of the Charter is, is, is very open, it, it, and, but it cannot extend beyond its natural and proper limits. We cannot create out of whole cloth an authority which has not been conferred upon us. We can give a large and liber liberal interpretation, and, we, and, and the jurisprudence underlines that, but just like uh, what was it, Lord was it Viscount Sankey, and and the Living Tree, um, I've forgotten which which is which is whose growth is is ongoing within its natural limits. I can't remember the exact uh, phrasing, but within its natural limits is the part that usually gets left out, because because within the limits of the, the, the protections and the rights that are guaranteed to Canadians under the Charter, we have a heavy responsibility. Beyond those limits, it really is up to the legislatures and the executive. And if we, and if we, and if we simply start making up rules on our own, I think we really have made a big mistake. All right, I think we have time for one final question. Um, and uh, potentially hotly contested here. How about we go right in the center here, um, sir, in the red jacket, yeah. Oh, Hank, can I ask you to pause just a moment? I'm, I'm sure that Justice Rowe can hear you, but the people behind you will not, so we will bring you a microphone. Uh, for clarity of your thesis, um, to what degree are you saying that the justices of the Supreme Court of Canada are analogous to the guardians in Plato's Republic? And if they are, to what degree is that necessary in a complex democracy to have persons such as yourself to be given the trust of that position to rise above your reference to Aristotelian democracy and the, the fracas of politics? Is such a body necessary to have guardians guarding themselves. I mean, of course, the, the comparison between Plato and, and the courts, not just the Supreme Court, all the courts, right? We're all vested with the same authority. We just happen to be at the top of the hierarchy. But the, the Superior Court judge can invalidate a law, can read down a law, can, can, can redefine Section 7. You may be called upon next week. <laughs> you know, that's, that's, that's your capacity as well as mine. It, it's a very imperfect comparison. I was being to some extent playful. 
when, when I put it up. Because, of course, Plato's guardians were essentially dictators. Right? They, 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 had, they had authority over everything. They, they probably had the power of life and death. Right? And that, that, I mean, no one would contemplate anything of that nature. That would be a catastrophe in, in, from our point of view. But the, the playfulness was to say uh, their power was so unlimited that the only check on it was how they viewed themselves. And so that was, the, in a sense, the playful way I said. Now, judges, there is a degree of comparison, a very limited degree of comparison, because in the end, on constitutional matters, constitutional amendment is not a very practical alternative. The use of Section 33 is very limited, actually. It's, it's far more limited than people think. You have to look at it very closely. And perhaps it's an unhappy event in any instance. So it's about keeping in mind what we should do and what we should lead to others in terms of what uh, decisions are made. But we can't step back at the same time from the role we've been given. I mean, if someone comes in and makes an argument that says this law is inconsistent with freedom of religion, this law is inconsistent, uh, or these actions by, the, by the, the police were inconsistent with the, the right to be protected against search and seizure, I have a responsibility. To, to vindicate the rights of that individual. So I'm not saying that our authority is invalid. I'm saying our authority is, is valid and, is, and its exercise is necessary, but just like Lord Sankey, you know, within its natural limits, if I can put it that way. Thank you so much, Justice Rowe. And I, think, I, I thank all of you for your questions, and I think it's been a most thought-provoking, uh, thought-provoking speech. I hope that you will go on to publish it so that we can return to it and reflect upon it. We have um, a small gift for you that you can uh, remember us by. And please join me, everyone, in thanking Justice Rowe once again.